The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. The Profile is the show where we delve into a person's life, faith and ministry. And it's brought to you in association with the UK's leading Christian magazine, that's Premier Christianity. If you'd like a free sample copy of the latest issue featuring interviews, reviews, news and so much more, head to our website, premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. enough time on this project to tell her whole story but what we can tell you is that one day July 4th she was diagnosed with a brain-eating amoeba with a mortality rate of 97 percent and not only did she have it but it's suspected that six of her children had a brain-eating amoeba and they expected all of them to die within a week but the church prayed profile i'm speaking to the grammy nominated gospel artist william mcdowell william serves as pastor of orlando florida's deeper fellowship church and he's recently released the cry a live worship experience he's previously released five critically acclaimed albums and collaborated with a variety of artists including tasha cobbs leonard and travis green william Welcome to the program. Ah, so happy to be here with you. Well, here on the show, we always like to go back to the beginning and hear about a person's life growing up. So I understand uh, you're from the U.S., is that right? I am. Uh, I, I'm from Orlando, Florida. Uh, originally grew up in, in Ohio, but uh, lived in Orlando now for 20 years wow. and uh, have made that my home and uh, where my family, where we're raising our family. So we're, we're honored to be there. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a bit about um, early life. Was Christian faith there right from the beginning? Absolutely. Our family has a lineage of, of, of being Christians. And so uh, from my earliest memories of childhood, uh, actually, my earliest memory uh, of childhood is actually telling my grandfather uh, when I was three uh, that I'm, I'm saved, but my parents don't believe me. <laughs> and I, that really came because I used to ask that I take communion. And they said, not until you get baptized and you're saved. I'm like, I am. I'm a believer. Uh, and so that was my, my earliest memory. But by uh, both uh, grandparents, uh, Christians and, and and uh, my parents are Christians, wow. and so our, our whole family has, has grown That's up That's really way. early, isn't it? Three years old to kind uh, of understand that. Yes, yes. But, you know, I, I used to wonder, okay, you know, how is that? But now I, I watch my own children. Uh, I, I have five children, uh, and I, my three-year-old daughter uh, right now, I mean, she's very much uh, a believer. Uh, and so they, they take him seriously. And so I, I see that, you know, it takes root in early age. Yeah. So what age did your parents let you get baptized? When I was five. Five? I, I got wow. baptized when I was five, and that was an exciting time for me. Wow. Yeah. And so with, with your own kids, are you kind of thinking about that in terms of what age you let them get baptized? you think about the same, maybe five? Well, really, it's it's really about, it's not necessarily an age thing more than it's an understanding mm. thing. Uh, as long as they understand what they're doing and understand what this means, mm. and, and then we see evidence of the fruit uh, of Christ in their life, uh, then, then we are 
absolutely open to doing it. So we're not saying you have to wait to a certain age. More than we want to make sure that they understand what they're doing when they do it. And uh, when they do, uh, and, and our oldest has already been baptized, uh, but when they really have an understanding, all of them are, are believers. Uh, you can see the early fruits of that, but really when it takes root in their heart uh, to the point where they really understand what baptism means, then, then we let them do it. Tell me a bit how, about how your faith grew from the age of five, kind of through teenage years. What was that like? Well, really, you know, my life has been set apart for God my entire life. Um, and, and that has been nurtured, you know, uh, mainly by my mother, uh, but also really... Uh, as I look back over my life, I can see the hand of the Lord on my life, you know, stirring, uh, keeping me uh, from things and, and, and shielding me from things and things that, that others were doing at, you know, in mm. a young age. What sort of stuff was that? Well, you know, it's pretty amazing um, how the Lord will protect you. Um, I, I, I'll give an example. It's, a, it's kind of a weird example. It just came to mind. I don't normally give. But I remember, uh, you know, being, uh, I, I, I would say maybe, 11 or 12 or something like that and you know we were riding bikes you know to kids houses and things of that nature now it was a different day now you yeah. can't do that kind of thing uh, much in the united states now but uh being 11 or 12 and and uh going over to this this kid's house and he found his dad's um stack of of illicit videos we'll call it uh and so he wanted to show all the guys like look at this you know whatever and i remember that even though there were no adults there there were no there was something in me that was like you should not be here right. and so literally got on my bike and went home uh and never watched never watched and and the interesting thing about that is now as you get older mm -hmm. you understand how the how the people a lot of people get hooked mm -hmm. is by seeing it really the first time age, really yeah. early age but yet i look back at that now now and I see the hand of the Lord literally shielding me saying I'm not going to let you get you know addicted to this mm -hmm. hooked into this and so I, I look back over my life and see how the Lord yeah. has been keeping me now part of that also is I was very active in church uh, from an early age and so really you know where, where people were doing other things you know mm -hmm. my mother had me in church but that was my interest uh, from a very young age as well but in part of that you know um, the church that I grew up in um, as a young child um, the music was really really great uh, at the church actually uh, Donald Lawrence was a music director of our church uh, and so the choir was always <laughs> really really good yeah. uh, and that kind of thing for those who know him who yeah is, yeah absolutely you know, but uh, so you know. was that kind of? Did you go straight in singing in the choir, or was it playing an instrument? What What did you get involved in it? Uh, playing instruments. Yeah. Uh, so I played keys and drums and organ and all wow. those things uh, very early. So I started uh, playing uh, for choirs and things like that when I was twelve. Yeah. Uh, and so that's quite common, isn't it? I mean, often when you speak to to gospel artists, uh -huh. that is the case. You really grew up in church, and there's yeah. such that that kind of musicality built in from such an early age. Yeah. yeah. And it really pays off, doesn't it? Because the it, long does. Term, you know. it, do, it does from a musicality standpoint you know obviously your your, your faith in christ has to grow mm -hmm. and so there has to be there has to be something that's rooted there than sure. more than just music sure. alone uh but what it does at least do is keep you uh in a place where where the seeds of faith can grow in you yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, so tell me about what that looked like practically was this kind of lessons in the week or was it just turning up on a sunday and learning as you go uh both right. uh and so um you know i started taking piano lessons when i was five right. uh and so so, you know, that's that's part of, you know, uh, my parents noticing that that nurturing that gift, so to speak, and, and watering that seed. So I, I took piano lessons for for years, uh, learning how to read music and classical music and all that stuff. Um, but my interest, of course, was gospel music. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, relative to the way that the gospel music is, particularly in the United States, as it relates to what they call um, I, I don't particularly care for the term, but what they call black gospel, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, that's more of an ear trained thing, mm -hmm. uh, more of a learned thing, learned by watching and learned by being immersed in uh, the atmosphere. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. like everyone else, that's how I learned that style as well. Yeah. I said at the beginning, you're, of course, now a pastor um, as well as someone who, who makes music. Did you sense a kind of call from God in your early years to, to either of those two things? I mean, did you, did you kind of know from quite an early age that you were going to go into either either music-based ministry or pastoring? 
So the answer, the 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 short answer is yes. <laughs> but I took a circuitous route to get there. I took a long way to get there <laughs> um, because I didn't have ministerial ambition. Right. Uh, you know, some people they want to be something big. They 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 you know they say, hey, I, I saw my name in lights, or I saw that you know I saw nations, or I saw that wasn't my path. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ultimately it, it was you know I. I understood that there was a call I understood that I'd want to do that with the rest of my life but I wasn't I didn't look at it as a career based thing sure. I, I looked at it as I'm willing to serve God mm -hmm. uh, no matter how you know no matter how long but if mm -hmm. I work you know a uh, 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 what, what you call a, a regular job or so to speak yeah. um, that I was willing to do that and, and serve the Lord and I know that that many people who are called still do that there's mm -hmm. very few of us mm -hmm. that get to do this full time mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, I never looked at it as a career path yeah. I just looked at it as, as something I was willing to surrender to God do, do you think that can be a temptation I guess for younger people today when they look at I don't know album charts or Instagram pages or YouTube and they think oh wow look at millions of hits and everyone knows who this person's name is do you think there can be a bit of a a wrong temptation to sort of chase after being well known more than serving God. Absolutely, um, it, it's a danger uh, because we we live in a society now in which you, in particularly because of the advent of social media, which when I was obviously that age, that Wasn't didn't around. exist. It yeah. didn't exist, and so now you know one of the things that we we have the temptation to do is to speed up God's clock. Um, but God has a process by which He takes us through mm -hmm. uh, in order to develop maturity in us. And a lot of times we try to circumvent that process now because in the social world, what we have is the ability to see people's gifting before their characters developed mm. uh, where, where in God's economy you know ultimately you know there, there has to be a character development that takes place first yeah. uh, that surrounds uh, or supports that gift that he's given you and so we, we are um, a, a generation that's inundated with the imagery of people our age or younger uh, seemingly doing better than us and so it causes us to feel like we're behind uh, when ultimately God has a time for everyone the, the scripture makes it clear the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord God mm. orders our steps he knows when we're ready he knows what he's called us to do. And, and a lot of times we, we can't try to get ahead of him. So tell me about how what you went through before being in full time ministry, how that has now shaped what you do now, what you what kind of lessons that God had to take you through to get sure, to where you are. Sure. Now. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I believe it's uh, Ian Bounds. I'm not sure I may be quoting it wrong, but but um, he makes a statement that um, it's, it's doubtful that God will ever use a man that he's not first bruised. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's one of those things where, you know, the process by which God takes you through, uh, whether that be isolation, which a lot of people don't like, or rejection, which a lot of people don't like, or failure, which a lot of people don't like, or, or, or the crushing or, or the laying down of your dreams, which a lot of people don't like. All of those are a part of the process. Um, working and going to school and and all of those, they're, they're all a part of the process. Um, um, some of us, um, we, we always talk about mentors, but sometimes um, we get tormentors. Uh, mm -hmm. Those, either way, they teach you. Uh, you learn. And so God, you know, will place people in your life, or place you in circumstances or situations. That happened a lot to me. Uh, and so it was not um, a uh, overnight thing. Yeah. I, I remember um, there was one particular uh, gospel show that I I did once once the Lord you know showed me enough favor uh, and and I remember that the the person said you know it seemed like you got here overnight and I looked it back and I said well then it was a long night <laughs> 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 because there's a process that that you know for for me yeah. um, I, I'll give an example um, I was I was ministering at a church um, a, a, a very gifted church uh, you know a lot of musical gifts a lot of you know several well known people have come out of that church yeah. uh, since that time and, mm -hmm. and they had a, a a trip a vision trip uh, in which they took. Uh, about 40 or 50 people that they thought, you know, God had really called them to, to use them in the nations of the earth and in, in different ways, musically, you know, that kind of thing. They took them on a trip to pour into them. They left me home. <laughs> so I, I wasn't considered to be one of the 40 or 50 people in that church that they, they thought God was going to use musically. Wow. Uh, and so it's one of those things where, you know, you, you, you take those experiences yeah. and you, you recognize that it's not man that calls you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's God that calls you. You know, man, you know, you look at the story of David, you know, Samuel, the prophet of God, who is the seer. You know, when God tells him, I've, I've anointed a new king at Jesse's house, when he sees Eliab, the first son, mm -hmm. uh, he looks at him and he says, this must be God's 
anointed. Yeah. He had the look, he had the sound, he had the whatever. Um, man, man can always find Eliab. It takes God to find David. And David's are always the ones who are in hidden places. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So how do you think about that, that sense of kind of God has raised me up to do this? And do you kind of believe that because you haven't fought for it? You know, you haven't chased after, I don't know, a record deal or whatever whatever success look, might look like for someone who looks at your career. Sure. For you, has it been a very deliberate kind of, I might want to chase after that stuff, but I'm going to choose to let God raise me up. You know, what, what does that look like practically? Well, you know, the foundational theology of worship uh, is, a, is a theology of submission mm. uh, and surrender to God. And so if you have that foundational theology of worship, then what you understand is that self-exaltation and self-denial can't coexist. Okay. Uh, it's either one or the other. Uh, and so if, if you take the posture of self-denial, then if the posture of self-denial is your posture, if God decides to put you on a platform while you've lived the posture of self-denial, then you know it's him and you know it's not you. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to come on and chat about the uh, the new record, The Cry. Yeah. And, you know, in listening to it, there's there's just so much I want to kind of delve into it and talk about, especially some of the miracles that you sure. mentioned even on the record. Sure. But I'd love to start with just kind of how the project came about, because as I listen to it, I think, wow, there's, there's real depth to this. And I don't want to, you know, be critical of other sure. projects out there, but let's sure. just say the level of depth to The Cry really was so wonderful to to listen to. It sounds like sounds like this man's been through some stuff personally. It yeah, sounds like this isn't yeah, just a worship yeah, record. It sounds yeah. like there's stuff that's happened in you that mm-hmm. is coming out through the music. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to hear more about exactly what that is. Absolutely. Well, you know, the way I would say it is that the cry is the project I was born to make. Um, now, I don't know what will come after this, but relative to, you know, the the cry and, and it being answered, that that's not something that you sit down and write. Mm-hmm. That's something that, that God takes you through an experience to bring you to. Um, you know, that's been a 20 year cry yeah. out to God. Um, I remember um, late 90s, uh, I, I read a book uh, that m- many people know um, called The God Chasers. Mm-hmm. Um, Tommy Tenney wrote it. And um, I remember a pastor gave me that book because of my hunger for God and said, you need to read this. And I remember reading that book uh, and literally after the first couple of chapters, I closed that book um, and I said, God, if this is what you're doing in the earth, if this is how people can experience you, I want to experience you this way. And I began crying out to God uh, to experience him that way. Uh, and and that had nothing to do with I want to make records. That had nothing. And literally, my cry was, I want to be somewhere where something like this happens, where if you if you pour out your spirit in such a way that causes people to change, it changes their life, mm-hmm. it, it 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 changes how they think, and that, that people who were there, because I know people now, I have the privilege of knowing people who were in that moment of when that book was written, that they still are marked by that moment, 20 something years later, that, that if you're gonna do something that marks people in such a way that for the rest of their life, there's a common bond between everyone who is experiencing that outpouring and then talking about that outpouring creates other outpourings Mm. I want in on that I want that and so that became the pursuit of my life was that once you discover that there's more in God than just a mundane everyday thing that that you can experience him in a way that marks you and changes you and changes generations of your life generations that come after you I want it and so I started crying out to God for that and that really became the impetus of what led to this so so um every project that I've done previous to the cry Mm -hmm. has been giving language to the pursuit of that kind of encounter. Mm-hmm. So it's been, you know, really it's it's letting people in on my private prayers, which is one of the reasons why the, the common thread throughout all these songs are about surrender and about mm-hmm. a move of God and about seeing these things. It was about this sense of, you know, we're, we're, we can, we can, we can experience this. And it's really so all songs are tools. So it was trying to encourage people uh, in a way how we can, you know, get, like this can happen mm-hmm. like we, we can experience this and and so every service every nation every recording every song was about 
positioning us to experience that, not knowing that the Lord was going to allow the very cry of my heart to be answered in the church that I pastor. Um, it, Cause I, I wasn't saying, you know, God, you know, give us a church that, that sees it was really, I just want to be somewhere where it, I don't care where it is. If it's Africa, if it's South America, if it's somewhere, I just whatever service. And so on May 22nd, 2016, the Lord decided to answer a 20 year cry. Uh, and, and what he did is not and the amazing thing. That's why I love our church so much is as you begin to talk to people um, it wasn't just my cry alone my cry was a 20 year cry but for others it might have been 20 months for others it might have been 20 weeks for others it might have been two years but what he decided to do was bring a bunch of people together at the same time and answer their cry their hunger at the same time the 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 presence of god um uh, so tangibly manifested uh, in in the room that day wow. that it marked all of us changed all of us um um, there was a, there was a, uh, without an announcement, without a, it wasn't a sermon preached. It wasn't a song that was sung. It was an awareness that he walked into the room mm-hmm. in such a way that caused everyone to fall on their face and weep for hours, uh, before the Lord, because it overwhelmed literally the term we use is undone uh, at the reality of his presence, uh, in that moment. And that was a marking day for us that, that that's why when you've had a genuine encounter with God, you know, when it is, it's not, it was around this time somewhere. <laughs> it was May. 22nd, 22nd, 2016. That was the beginning uh, of what we experienced. And since that and this time, this was in your church. This was in our 20th. church yeah. uh, in Orlando. Um, and since that time, the, what we've begun to experience as a, as a result of that, you know, the reality of what we call an open heaven, which is really, you know, best explained by easy access, mm-hmm. uh, which we all have, but most people just aren't aware of it. Mm-hmm. But but easy access, um, um, continual awareness uh, of, of him and so we we began to to adopt um, a different mentality altogether. One of the the it may seem like semantics, but it's not. One of the the significant mentality uh, shifts for us was that he's not in our presence; we're in his. Um, and and the reason why that's a significant shift for us is because it causes us to know that that. It's him that's in control of the moment we change the name. And it, again, it's not just semantics, but we change the name of, of our gatherings from services to rivers. Uh, oh, wow. uh, we call them rivers because ultimately he's in control. He's leading uh, the flow of yes. what happens. Um, there, there's a scripture that talks about uh, on the river of God, no mighty ship with oars shall pass, uh, which oars represent human effort or the ability to direct the service itself. So we've, we've kind of adopted this mentality. We throw away our oars and put up our sails. Wow. Let him take us wherever. So, so you were you were praying yeah. uh, for years for this thing to happen, and you pinpointed to this date, May twenty yeah. second, yeah. when God's spirit, I guess, just fell in a new way on your church. It was, mm-hmm. it was just a normal Sunday meeting, yeah. was this? Yeah, yeah. And since then. Nothing has been the nothing's same. been the same, uh, and I, I, you know, I spent so much time talking about these things first because what ultimately happens is, you know, as a result of that, some of the other things that are taking place, we've seen in the miraculous take mm. place in our church without a healing service, hundreds and hundreds of miracles. Mm. The, the, the challenge that I've found uh, is that you know everyone wants to talk about the miracles, which is fine yeah. and it's a good thing yeah. because it really, it, it really, you know, shows a tangible existence mm. of. of the supernatural power of God. Uh, But the testimony uh, is not the miracles itself. That's just an external manifestation. It's really his presence, uh, which has been among us and and continues to be among us uh, three years later. Mm -hmm. And so all of the songs of the cry are written out of that encounter, Mm -hmm. out of that place, out of those revelations and out of those and testifying Mm -hmm. of the things that we've seen and heard. Wow. Yeah. And what do you, I guess I kind of want to ask almost theologically, what do you attribute this sudden breaking of the spirit to? I mean, is it is it that you were praying for this for so long and you had to really press in with prayer and really dedicate yourself to prayer and then God answered that prayer finally? Mm-hmm. You know, is, because people hear sure. your story and they think, I want that for my church. Sure. How can God's spirit break in? Sure. How can suddenly we change the name from services to rivers? Sure. And how sure. can we suddenly see all the miracles? Sure. Sure. And I suppose to a certain extent you can never answer that question because God does what God wants. Correct. But is there anything you can point to of, of how we allowed ourselves to be open to God's spirit? Well, we've, we've you know... I'm so glad you said it the way that you said it because, you know, I don't feel like it can be codified. Um, I don't feel like there's a specific causal that mm-hmm. leads to an effect. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wish it was that easy. Sure. Um, but I think one of the reasons why it's important to talk about the journey, our, our foundation has been prayer. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and we are, you know, 
outsiders looking in, they would say it, it's worship. And that's a, it is a huge component of what we do. Uh, but the foundation of, of mm. what brings us together yeah. has been prayer and a crying out to God. Uh, and so we've discovered there's certain postures. Uh, I actually wrote a book about it called It's Happening. Um, that's not a plug, but it's just literally. <laughs> no, seriously. It's all right. Um, <laughs> we let plugs happen. It's fine. Um, not a problem. Um, but, but, but really, um, as we begin to examine uh, certain postures uh, that we've, we've kept, but those postures really, um, were, were postures that we learned after the fact mm. to, to try to, to, to host him uh, more than it has been something that we said you know ahead of time is a, is a, it, a kind of codifying thing that's a cause or effect. I think the, the, the one thing we've kind of looked at it like okay you know when, when uh, Elisha asked Naaman to dip into the Jordan River seven times, mm -hmm. you know, Naaman's response was, aren't, aren't the rivers and at home better? The far, far on the banner, they're better. You know, why, why do I have to dip in this dirty Jordan? And for whatever reason, it's kind of what we call the scandal of particularity, which is that God will sometimes just choose a place, yeah. choose a people to, to do something. Yes. And, and, and so what we've understood is that are there better places? Are there more organized places? Are there bigger places? Are there people that would do it better? For sure. And I think that for us, we don't feel like um, we're the only place where that's happening. We know that God is moving around the mm -hmm. world. But what we have done is we've decided to to keep a posture um, that that invites him to stay. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I feel like gets tested a lot in a lot of places is hunger um, where what we call the hunger test in Luke chapter 24 uh, you see this this passage of scripture where Jesus is is walking with two disciples on the Emmaus road and um, they don't recognize him at first um, you know they get to their destination after the seven mile walk of talking with Jesus and and the scripture records these words he acted as if he were going to keep going which lets us know that he actually didn't want to he just wanted to know that they wanted him to stay uh, and the scripture says they begged him to stay so he did uh, and I, one of the things we've discovered you know scripturally he stays where he's welcome mm -hmm. he leaves where he's rejected and I don't know that that we understand a lot of times that by our programs by our behavior by our thought process by however we host mm -hmm. sometimes we reject him without knowing it yeah. um, and yeah. so we've just been a people who have decided you know when you have an account with him. Mm. If you want him to stay, everything about your life has to change. Mm. Uh, and, and that has been something for us that says, okay, it changes what we talk about, what we watch, what we listen mm. to, where we go. I mean, it changes everything. If you really want him, yeah. it changes everything. Yeah, I'd love to press into that a little bit more because quite often we uh, like to ask people about well, what, what does faith look like for you on a kind of day-to-day -day practical level? And we've been hearing a lot of people recently kind of talking about almost rediscovering some of the, what, what a term spiritual disciplines or mm -hmm. the practices of Jesus and mm -hmm. I'd just love to hear from you what's giving you life in that area at the moment what sort of practices might be daily or weekly or monthly yeah. are really bringing you yeah. life and helping you connect to God well for me it's living a life um, number one uh, that's pleasing to him mm -hmm. um, and, and what that means then is that I don't want to do anything that hurts his heart. Um, I, I think that, you know, the, the idea of, of the law being written on your heart is the fact that you recognize that his heart can be broken. Uh, and so then it's not about, you know, keeping a list of do's and don'ts because you're trying to please a distant deity. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a person of the Holy Spirit whose heart can be broken or grieved uh, by the way that we live. And so ultimately I want to live in a way uh, where I can hear him at all times, where I can sense him at all times. And so that means that if there's anything in my life that, that takes me away from or takes my mind or, or my thoughts away from him, um, I'm I'm eliminating those things. I don't live in a way in which distractions have the ability to take my attention from him. Uh, and so it's it's a daily, not just morning or evening awareness, but literally an all day uh, desire to be aware of and sensitive to his spirit at all times. And so if there's anything in my life. Um, so for me, um, you know, and this is everyone, everyone's different, okay? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not making this a prescriptive sure. thing yeah. here. But for me, the reason why I don't listen to mainstream music is not because I say it's inherently sinful, although, you know, there are some things that can draw your mind away into, into some other thoughts. But for me, if it does not bring my mind to focus on him, I don't want it. You know, if there's anything in my life that causes me to not be able to hear him, I don't want it. Why? Because I could be sitting here with you right now, but the spirit of God could literally have something he wants to say to you. 
and he might want to speak to me about it, but I can't hear it because I'm so consumed with myself mm-hmm. or my own thoughts, and I want to make sure yeah. that I live in a way that I can hear God at all times. Premier Christianity Magazine. In this month's issue, we invite leading scholars to unpack the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth and explain why we can have confidence in these stories. Plus, we speak with the indomitable Anne Widdicombe ahead of the general election and explore our alternative Christmas gift guide with ethical and sustainable gifts for all budgets. All this and more in December's issue. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome back to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hale. Today my guest on the show is the Grammy-nominated gospel artist, William McDowell. I have to tell you, I have been so enjoying and appreciating his latest album. It's called The Cry, published by Integrity Music and available everywhere now. We're going to talk lots more about that project and the rest of William McDowell's life, career and faith in part two. Here it is. We're recording this uh, days after Kanye West has brought Mm. out this album, Jesus is King. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's fascinating because Kanye West is not someone who's known for making gospel music at all. Um, Made a lot of music in the past. Previous to this moment. Yeah, made a lot of music in the past that Christians would not want to go anywhere near for understandable reasons. And yet this new record is, as far as I can tell, is just full of proclaiming Jesus is King, Jesus Lord. What do you make of this? I mean, what is is going on here? I think it's amazing. Um, Everyone... We pray all the time that people have encounters with God. Mm. Um, And then when they have an encounter with God, uh, out of encounters with God should be something that is birth. It should birth something, number one, fruit in your own life. Uh, But then also, you know, if if, 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 if there's something in you that you've had an encounter that that causes you to want to proclaim it to other people, um, by all means, you should. Uh, And and so I'm, I'm... you know, we get a lot of prophecies and things of that nature where people will say, you know, God's getting ready to, to you know, invade the entertainment space. It's going to, you know, turn the hearts of people in, in certain spheres and sectors. And then when it happens, we're shocked. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but ultimately, you have to think, yes. you know, I'm sure, um, I mean, Ananias said the same thing about Saul when God had his conversion uh, with him. on the <laughs> So, you know, when God spoke to Ananias and said, I want you to go, um, the, 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 here's the, the, the significant word. He says, I want you to go and I want you to pray uh, for Saul to receive his sight because mm-hmm. he's had an encounter with me. And Ananias says, wait, the same Saul that used to kill and persecute Christians? Yeah. He said, yeah, that yeah. one. But when Ananias got to his house, do you know what he said? He said, brother Saul, God sent me. Which was to say that if God spoke to me, you had an encounter with God. Now you're my brother. Yeah. So he says, brother Saul, God sent me to pray for you. And that was that was it. It, it took someone to, to, to lay down their own thoughts about what Saul used to be and say, if you've had an encounter with God, it's the same encounter yeah. I've had. It's, it's so true, isn't it? That we, as you say, we pray and we prophesy this person, pray they'll become a Christian because they have such huge influence. Mm-hmm. And yet when they do, so often our natural tendency is to be cynical and say, sure. well, it's probably not real. Sure. No, we, we, we can't, you know, ultimately, you know, over the, the over the course of life, fruit bears that out. Yeah. You know. Time will tell as yep. well, I suppose. Yep. But it's an encouraging sign for sure. And he's he's not the only person. There's been a number of other mainstream figures recently, haven't they? Mm-hmm. Making go- I mean, I think of Snoop Dogg. Who could have mm-hmm. predicted that Snoop sure. Dogg would make a gospel album? Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. God is, God is it, it's an indication of, of the acceleration of the time, uh, that, that there is no limit to what the Lord can do. I mean, we're, we're seeing, you know, these moves of God. We, we talk about them from an entertainment standpoint, but there's some moves of God taking place mm-hmm. around the world in Iran and in mm-hmm. China that are just significant. I'd love to hear some more from you because I, I know you travel internationally, um, I think I heard though recently, obviously, because of everything that's begun with your church and your commitments pastoring, I understand you're perhaps not traveling as much as you as you once did. I still travel a lot. Still travel a lot, okay. <laughs> but I just don't travel as much as I did. Sure. Uh, and part of the reason, it, it it's not just responsibility only. It's, I made, and I know it's not an even trade, uh, but... I said to the Lord, if you're going to be here, I'm going to be here. Mm-hmm. Why would I want to be anywhere else when yeah. he's moving the way that yeah. he's moving at so, home? But tell me what you are seeing um, around the world, because I'd love to hear your perspective as someone who has has toured, has seen what God's doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, what excites you about the global church and what have you personally witnessed? Yeah, yeah. well, there is a, a 
awakening within this generation of the reality of, and this is the way I'm going to say it, uh, the reality of another world, uh, meaning that that the 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 reality of the kingdom uh, pressing on the earth or overtaking. Uh, it, it's, so the hunger for for seeing God move supernaturally uh, is increasing dramatically uh, around the world, and so this 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 stirring or this cry uh, mm-hmm. that's in people to see God move in a significant way that moves us out of a place of complacency and really into a place of, of seeing him demonstrate himself uh, is growing uh, and and the interest in that is growing and and so there's kind of this unique um, uh, almost opposites right now you have this this massive complacency yeah. uh against this massive hunger uh and it seems like the hunger is rising uh and it, it's causing people to, to be awakened uh and almost you know pushed out of their complacency i feel like the lord's doing that mm-hmm. one of the things the lord is, is doing is he's delivering people from low expectation and provoking their cry mm-hmm. uh people who have made peace with disappointment he's provoking that cry what he sees he's literally causing what we call righteous envy uh which is when he does something for someone and someone or through something someone in order to make you jealous for it so that you'll cry out for what he wanted you to have all along. Mm -hmm. He wants you to have it, but he literally will do it somewhere to awaken your interest. And so I feel like what the Lord is doing is he's taking some places Mm -hmm. strategically Mm -hmm. and he's doing some things almost showing off to say, if just in case you forgot who I am and forgot what I do, I'm going to demonstrate to this generation and the generations that are coming that this is who I am. Something I said to, to, uh, and a dedication to my children, um, um, when we wrote the book, it's happening in the dedication to my children. You know, it, here it chronicles, you know, the miraculous and things of that nature. And I said to them, if anyone ever tells you that God does not move this way, you'll know that not only did your daddy see it, but you grew up around it as well. And so you'll be able to literally with empirical evidence, refute the idea that God does not do yeah. this. And so I feel like what the Lord is doing, he's, he's done it. You know, he, he's never stopped being God. So he's done it in every generation but there's this awakening within this generation mm. to, to rock us out of the place of low expectation and complacency. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to hear a spe- um, couple of kind of specific examples of those miracles you mentioned, mm-hmm. especially when you talk about the, the evidence for it. Because I think sometimes even Christians can be skeptical of healings Absolutely. or miracles. Absolutely. And it's been interesting to hear more and more um, people involved in healing ministry, more and more they'll talk about actually going back and getting a doctor's report and even mm-hmm. as far as we can medically mm-hmm. verifying mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So I think it does help some people. It can sure. even help those who don't believe. Sure. If you can say, well, here's a doctor's sure. report. And I, sure. I understand, you know, you're, you're keen on, as any pastor would be, yeah. verifying these yeah. things and yeah. making sure it's real. Well, because honestly, you know, anything that's not verifiable then causes everything else to be in exactly. question. Uh, exactly. And so, you know, obviously with some things you just have to take people at their word. Sure. You know, they say they have a pain and now they don't have it anymore. Yeah. I mean, obviously you have to take it, but but there's some of the things that we've seen, you know, become undeniable. Yeah, tell, when me, people tell me some of them. roll in in a wheelchair yeah, and yeah. they walk out, that's an undeniable sure. thing. When someone comes in blind and they leave seeing, wow. that's an undeniable thing. When someone comes in deaf and they leave hearing, that's an undeniable thing. But one of the things that, that for us has been a significant uh, testimony and it was a part of the project the cry and the song still moving mm-hmm. uh, the executive pastor of our church uh, he actually uh, I call him my brother uh, because I'm my only child but I've known him for 30 years and so he's he's really closer than a friend he's like a brother to me but um, he has 10 children um, he's a very blessed person <laughs> um, but but uh, on July 4 2017 uh, his his son called him at work and said you need to get home quick something's wrong with mom uh, and so you know he calls and says you know what's what's going on and she says we need to get here something's wrong I'm you know in so much pain she's like what's your pain level she says a 10 and the reason I, I bring that up is because any woman who's given birth to that many children that tells you her pain level is a 10 uh, <laughs> you, something's wrong <laughs> and so um, they get her to the hospital uh, they begin looking at a number of things that they really were suspecting that she had spinal meningitis uh, which we know is, is pretty dangerous um, but as they were looking they were you know kind of saying well what she was pregnant at the time and said we really need to get you to another hospital that can better take care of you and the baby as they're walking out and she's being transported in the ambulance as they're walking out um one of the nurses comes up to him and says you know sir can i can i walk you to your car and what you thought was odd and so the nurse said hey i I know i'm not really supposed to tell you this but just i i saw that you're a believer because they they prayed in the hospital he said i know i'm a believer too i just want to you know tell you how you can pray for your wife they're looking for something far more serious than you know uh spinal meningitis they think she may have uh an amoeba 
Uh, and so uh, he calls. I'm already praying with him, and, and several of, several of us are praying. Mm-hmm. He says, "You know, um, you know, help me pray that it's not this." And you know, I didn't know what an amoeba was, so I, I immediately went to Google, <laughs> and I looked up amoeba, and I was like, "Oh." Uh, we really, really need to pray. Wow. Um, it, it just it, 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 it's a microorganism that enters the body and eats the brain, wow. uh, and so um, and, and the mortality rate is significant. Ninety-seven percent right. uh, of the people, at least in the United States, who have ever received it have passed away. Uh, and so uh, take her to the hospital. They confirm that she has an amoeba. Uh, the life expectancy is anywhere from one day to five days. And so I'm thinking, here's my brother, you know, my friend of 30 years, yeah. facing you know, potentially losing his wife. Yeah. They ask about, you know, the kids, how are the kids doing? They call back home, all the kids have the symptoms. Yeah. So now six of their kids are now also in the hospital with this confirmed brain eating amoeba. And it is it is a moment where now we are literally sending, you know, request around the world, please pray, mm-hmm. please pray. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's amazing because I, I remember, um, we, uh, my friend Caleb was with me now. Uh, we, we went to the hospital and, and, and met with Jason. And, you know, she's in a neural, you know, uh, ICU unit. And, I mean, it, it's it's a pretty dire mm-hmm. situation. Um, and, and we're praying, you know, that the Lord would really move in a significant way. And, and now they're talking about you know, the only way to, to treat this is to, you know, um, induce a coma uh, for her and six of the kids, uh, mm-hmm. drill a hole in their head, um, so that they can put antibiotics in them, lower their body temperature to keep that amoeba from moving towards the brain, and yeah. with a three percent chance to live. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was this was what they planned on doing. Um, but our our church and people around the world were praying, uh, and God did something so miraculous for them. Um, he healed all seven of them before the medicine was ever administered, before the coma was ever given or induced. Um, he healed all seven of them, cleared all seven of, of this brain eating amoeba. And the significance of this is that um, I was just watching uh, uh, one of our national news programs uh, in the United States, and, and they were doing a report, unfortunately, about a, a, a man who had passed away from an amoeba, because um, it's pretty rare. And they were talking about in the last 60 years, there's been 145 cases, and they only knew of four medical survivors. Um, but I look back at the TV and I'm like, there are 11 yes. because seven of them are yeah. in our church. Yeah. But the reason why they're not considered to be medical survivors is because they never had to have the medicine administered. Uh, God healed them all, all seven of them. And that is a, a, a story that we will tell uh, to, the, to the end of our life yeah. because there are more living survivors in our church than in the combined history of the United States. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. What was the doctor's reaction to all this? They are, there's such a, a, a gratitude that's there. Whenever they go back to the hospital or that kind of thing, yeah. you know, all, because the whole hospital, the entire hospital was aware mm. of this thing because obviously you're talking it's so about. so rare, yeah. Well, not only is it rare, but you're, this was about to be a tragic story. Right. A mom and six kids yeah. pass away. Yeah. I mean, that is just, you sure. know, and so there is a, they, they, they all like, we remember you and oh my gosh, and we're so happy and we're so, I mean, just, just, it's, it's one of those things where people can literally say only God, yeah. only God yeah. can do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, so there is no medical explanation. For no, that. there's no medical yeah. explanation for that. Only wow. God can do that. What an amazing testimony. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. And that's one of hundreds. And, you know, as I say on the record, you, I think you, you tell that story, obviously, in a briefer in form. A brief, yeah. And it's wonderful to hear yeah. the longer form. Yeah, yeah. What a, and what it's even longer than that. We actually recorded uh, uh, them telling their story right. from firsthand. It took an hour wow. for them to tell their story just of that, that healing yeah. alone. Yeah. Yeah. And what I love about the record is there's this incredible sense of just faith mm-hmm. just throughout, mm-hmm. you know, declaring nothing is impossible, yes. all things are possible. Yes. Over and, and not just in that song, but throughout, there's yeah. that incredible sense of faith. And has that been, I guess, born out of partly of just personal experience of how God's been moving through your church? Absolutely. So, as I said earlier, the every project leading to this moment uh, was talking about what could happen 
positioning mm-hmm. ourselves for what could happen. This project is as a result of what did happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what makes it different. Um, I actually took the longest break of recording between my last project and this one, and that is because of this move of God. And I really wasn't thinking about, I need to make a CD. I wasn't thinking that at all. It was really about, you know, after uh, a course of times, like how can we invite others in on it? How can we get people a picture in on it? How can we allow others to experience it? How can we give them language, uh, you know, to really come from that place? And that's where this was was birthed. So literally, every declaration, every sentence, and every word has purposeful meaning for us on this. It's amazing. There, it wasn't just let's get together with some songwriters and write some songs. Yeah. It was really, you know, how can we give people language and invite them into what we've been experiencing the last three and a half years? Yeah. 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 So tell me, tell me a bit more about the, about the songwriting Mm -hmm. process. What Mm -hmm. does that look like for you? Well, so songwriting is a gift uh, and songwriting is a craft. Uh, And so what I mean by that is that, you know, you can wait for inspiration uh, or you can actually, you know, press into Mm -hmm. the craft of it and things of that nature. I'm aware that the gift and the craft live in me, Mm -hmm. but I choose to wait for inspiration. Okay. Uh, not everyone does that. Mm-hmm. That I don't. You don't have to do yes. that. That's not the only way yes. that you write songs. But but I, I choose to wait until God impresses something mm-hmm. in on me, so that we're writing out of a place mm-hmm. instead of writing to a place. And it's much. It, surely it's much easier that way, right? When the inspiration strikes. It, it is. Uh, but it, it it creates more pressure. Okay. Uh, and the reason why it creates more pressure is because now you have a deadline. Yeah. Uh, you have a deadline in which you know you have to deliver. Yes. You know deliverables. And you if know. you've got a deadline, we need these songs, and the inspiration hasn't struck. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Uh, and so you know from that you know there were uh, <laughs> I, I I love you know my new partnership with Integrity, uh, but I had to ignore a lot of calls <laughs> but how's it coming i'm like it'll be fine <laughs> uh, because i i knew that you know positioning myself for you know inspiration is, is it, that also the part of the craft of inspiration is getting silent enough to to hear mm. you know uh and so for me whenever i'm in that space i don't listen to anything else i don't listen to anyone's music i don't know because not so, so it sounds so generic but people will say you know what's your inspiration i'm like god himself <laughs> and and i mean they're looking for you to that say question off my list. <laughs> <laughs> god himself he he is the inspiration he, he's so fascinating uh that there, there's no end to him his greatness is unsearchable and so literally if you press into him you'll never be uninspired mm. uh there, there'll never be so really it's about how do we find Find the language to describe the indescribable God. This is this is the the nature of worship songwriting, which is completely different than every other genre mm-hmm. of music, whether mainstream or anything else. It's yeah. the fact that we are attempting in a futile attempt to describe an indescribable God. Mm-hmm. This is why we'll write songs forever. forever. You know, it, it, it just so that that part of that process was of waiting uh, to to get language uh, to really you know say okay you know now i do have you know some pretty amazing friends who uh you know i can collaborate with mm-hmm. so you know i i did a lot of collaborations on this one mm-hmm. uh, from a songwriting standpoint but part yeah. of that was i didn't want to um within myself solely um try to to you know come up with melodic ideas and things of that nature what i wanted to do was actually through conversation begin to describe to people what it is i've been experiencing Mm -hmm. and then see what that birthed in them uh, as we begin to talk about it because that there's a there's a synergism that happens when other people catch it Mm -hmm. when they're like i you know oh my gosh like i've been feeling this too or i've never heard anything like this and so then literally they go away and they say "I, i could not stop thinking about what you told me last night and this birthed in me and then we we just collaborate yeah. on that so that's yeah so how much of what we hear because it's a live record how much of what we hear is uh, kind of spontaneous and in the moment uh so with all of our projects there's a lot of uh spontaneity yeah. uh which is we, we create room for spontaneity yeah. um and so you know you, you can't script the, the reason why you do a live project is to capture atmosphere mm. if you're trying to capture the song you can do that in the studio yes. but you do it live to and capture my goodness atmosphere. there are bucket loads of atmosphere on this record yes, it's yes. just it's incredible you feel like you're in the room 
that that's the goal. That's the goal to literally have you transported to another place and to experience it that way. Uh, and so, you know, all declarations, all exhortations, mm. they're all all of those are in the moment. Mm. Everything that is said, all of them are in the moment. None of them are scripted. But we had uh, a few moments that were just. Uh, explosions in the room. Uh, one of them was a song called Nothing Like Your Presence, which I did with Travis Green and Nathaniel Bassey. Um, that song, what happened on that song, even what you hear, it, it's a 14-minute song yeah. on the project. It was a 25-minute song <laughs> that night. Wow. But written, like previous to that, it's a three-and-a-half-minute song. Wow. But <laughs> but so in rehearsal it's a three and a half yeah. minute song written if I was sitting on the piano it's a three and a half minute song what God did that night with that song the atmosphere the explosion that became 25 minutes of spontaneity um, I would say 90% of that song that you hear is spontaneous um, there's a song called I Don't Want to Leave uh, which is the last song on the project mm. um, that was a 22 minute moment that's reduced down to you know, four minutes for radio, wow. and yeah. you know, but that was just an incredible moment that happened in the room. All of those. I mean, it's already moments. like a, it's already a long album, with plenty <laughs> of tracks. But it sounds like, how long did you? Re- was this one night or two nights? One night. One night. One night. Is that a long night then? <laughs> it, to other people. <laughs> to me. To me. <laughs> well, not well, for you. I, I, well, I'll say it to you. I'll say it to you this way. You know, two things I'll say. You know, one is, you know, when you're in the presence of mm. God, time you know, flies. Time flies. Yeah. Um, and, and for us, it's, it's been that way. But then I, I would say the second thing, too, is, is, you know, how do you take a three and a half year encounter with God mm. and reduce it to a night? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, 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 yeah. that's literally so. So honestly, it could have been way longer. Yeah. There, there comes a moment. I mean, if you, I think about, okay, so now I've written a 240-page book, and I have uh, a, a full night of songs, and it's only the tip of the iceberg of mm. what I've experienced in the last three and a half years. Mm. Yeah. That must mean there's more music on the way then. Maybe. Maybe it, it means that there's more books on the way. It mm-hmm. means that there's there's more there's more you know ultimately any movement that lasts has to be reproduced in in people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you know for us it, it, you know we we launched a worship school and some other things that really kind of help you know take from this encounter and and birth it you mm-hmm. know so that the other people are carriers of the encounter. If all of it has to come from me, it won't last very long. Mm-hmm. You know. How would you describe your calling? That's an interesting question. Um, it, it, it's broadening. It, it, it's what it's doing. Mm-hmm. I, I think that, um, you know, I'm in a, a transition phase mm-hmm. uh, in my life. If you would have asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have thought I would have had a more laser focused answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the more uh, that I live, uh, the broader the call becomes uh, as it relates to, you know, now I would have never said 10 years ago that my calling is a generational calling mm-hmm. as it relates to making sure that we raise up another generation to be carriers of encounter. Uh, but that that's more of my mm. my focus now is that your focus uh, i guess sort of day to day as a pastor is that how that plays in mentoring well, next generation so, yeah um you know i look at it this way you know i have the same call with different iterations mm. of it uh and so it all comes from the same place so mm. whether it's it's writing or music or pastoring or raising my children mm. it's all the same all the call. Same thing. it's all the same call yeah yep. yeah that's a great way of looking at it What's been the best day of your ministry and what's been the toughest day of your ministry? Hmm. The best day, I'm in them. <laughs> I'm in them, but it's not a day, it's a moment. Mm. It, it's, I'm in them right now. Um, I think uh, tough days are, are, they're plenty. You know, I mean, th- that's a part of, that's a part of this. Sometimes you can be in your best days and your toughest days still be in them. You know, that it, it's, it's both at the same time. It's both at the same time. You know, this is this is a part of, of, of you know, Christian faith. I think that, you know, we, we look at hills and valleys mm. a lot mm. um, as if we're on the mountaintop and then we're in the valley. But but whenever we're in the valley, he's still with us. Yeah. And as long as he's with us, then, you know, we're still in our best days. Do you ever wonder what your life would look like had you not had that amazing Christian upbringing that we spoke about at the beginning, getting baptized at such a young age? Do you ever wonder what would what would I be doing now if I hadn't have had that early input in, and guidance into what it means to live for God? I don't wonder that. <laughs> um, and what I know is what every believer knows. We'd be lost if he hadn't found us. 
Um, you know, what, when I was younger, I used to feel like, you know, I didn't have a testimony because I didn't have this previous to being, you know, saved experience. I wasn't, you know, a, yeah, a, I wasn't this, but, yeah. but when you really understand the gospel, yes. uh, what you really understand about the gospel is that all of us were in the same state, whether we were in a bar, whether we grew up in church, we were yeah. all in the same state until he found us and revealed himself to us. Uh, and so the reason why I answer the question that I don't wonder is because I know that I'd be lost, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I know according to my full understanding of the gospel of Christ. At the same time, because mm -hmm. I've been captured by him, I never think about what it would be like to be without him. That, that is, that I just don't, because he so satisfies us that, that you, you're, you know, when you've had a true encounter with God, you don't have wandering eyes. Mm -hmm. I always like to ask people who come and visit the UK from further afield, I always like to talk about this idea I have of kind of cultural blind spots. And what I mean by this is when you grow up in a culture, so I've grown up in the UK, I think some things are just normal. And then I travel and I realize, oh, hang on, people do it differently. Sure. And, and what's wonderful about traveling, of course, is you notice that other Christians in other parts of the world do things or think things differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you realize that what I've brought up in may not actually be a biblical sure. view. It may just sure. be a cultural thing. Yes, yep. And so I always like to ask people who are coming in from further afield, what are the things you've noticed about the UK? Either, either good or, or more questionable. You think actually, you know, maybe it's something I've learned from the UK church or something I see in the UK church. I think actually I'm not so not so sure about that. Oh, <laughs> I won't wait into that too deep. Oh, go I on. can get in trouble. We're all friends uh, here. But but I you know I think that that the in America, for example, um, the what we call religious liberty mm. or religious freedom uh, is a little bit more uh, than it is here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it really tests the genuineness of, of the faith of the people here uh, because it is not as culturally acceptable yes. here as yeah. it is, you know, in Absolutely. America, yeah. although we're 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 heading some places. Sure. Uh, but so so to identify as a believer mm. here um, is a is a it, it has to be a real thing yes. uh, because there's a, a, an amalgamation of cultures here yeah. in London uh, and and religious views, yes. uh, both, you know, other religions and also atheistic in nature uh, that, that cause, you know, uh, the believers to have to be really rooted and grounded. And so it has to matter to them. And then, of course, you know, the decisions that the churches have to make here mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the stricter laws mm -hmm. uh, then also test the genuineness of the faith. Are you really committed to it? Yeah. Uh, it's not just a political ideology, but, but something yeah. that really is, is rooted deeply in the people. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that, you know, you do notice, you yeah. know, here versus, you know, you can identify uh, as a Christian, you know, in, in America um, as an ideology or mm. as a romantic idea, but mm. really not be committed to it because there's nothing pressing in on your yes. commitment level. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like there c it can be, there can be a safety still in mm -hmm. culturally identifying yep. as a Christian. Yep. I think you're right. Increasingly in Europe and certainly in the UK, yep. you don't really choose to identify as a Christian unless you really mean that's it. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's fascinating. Well, sadly, we're out of time, but William, thank you so much for coming in and talking. It's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise. Likewise. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hales, and my guest on the show today has been William McDowell. My thanks to him. And one final reminder, you do want to check out his latest album. It's called The Cry. It's a phenomenal album. I highly recommend it. This show is brought to you in association with the magazine that I edit. That's Premier Christianity magazine. If you would like to have a look at our latest issue, you can request a print copy absolutely free. Just go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. We'll be back next week with another great interview for you. See you then.